Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, Jason McPhee, uh, an engineer, engineer for the state of California, John, uh, and uh, John Cameron, who uh, is the author of Recall and Re Re Rewire Kill. and Rekill. Re Rewire and Rekill. Thrillers both. And they're thrilling. And, and, and the new uh, uh, aristocracy. Aristocracy is not uh, expected to be out in March of next year. And you've read an advanced copy. I tortured you because I didn't have the ending in the copy you read. You did torture me. It was it was it was the cliffhanger, and it's still yeah. and it's still hanging, it's still hanging. You have to finish that book so I can. I, I shall. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, also a uh, fun uh, a development officer at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Uh, there was a man. See, this is a legal case. You might be interested in this one. Uh, a man in Louisiana, 24 year old uh, black guy, was accused of rape raping a couple of, uh, one of them an underage woman and, or a girl, and he was in police custody. They were uh, interrogating him, and he said uh, something along the lines of, I, you know, I, I, I don't like the way this thing is going. I want you to, you know, you need to give me a lawyer, dog. And yeah, I want the, a lawyer, dog. And like. the police willfully misinterpreted what he said as asking for Rin Tin Tin Esquire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which the Louisiana Supreme Court bought because yeah. uh, he was ultimately convicted. Yeah. And uh, when he went up on appeal, yeah. uh, he was asking that that evidence, that, that, that uh, you know, the fact that he was not represented by a lawyer when he asked for a lawyer, mm -hmm. which is kind of a you know, standard Miranda yeah. uh, requirement, mm -hmm. he didn't get that. So he, if you, know. you if you want a lawyer, one will be provided, and questioning will immediately cease right. until you get Once one. Once you say, "I want a lawyer," now here's the question: If he would have said, if he would have been a white guy and said, "Like, wow, dude, dude, I want a lawyer, dude," instead of, "I want a lawyer, dog," um, would they have reacted the same? And I suspect that they would not have Well, you never know. We're talking about New Orleans police here, and they may have, <laughs> I don't know. In any yeah, case. Yeah, dude might have upset him more than dog. You know, who knows? Who, who yeah. knows? Yeah. The point is that they were clearly overstepping their bounds, and the Louisiana Supreme Court upheld the police well, this kind of, interpretation. You know, that, this, of is, <laughs> this is something I am not. Fundamental Fifth Amendment law. I'm, I'm not an attorney, and, and uh, you can tell, look, no belly scales, that's no. Uh, we, we have some stunningly brilliant attorneys whose, whose passion for defending constitutional rights knows no bounds, literally. Uh, they will do anything to, to try to protect people from, from government overreach. And the, a problem they talk about constantly is deference, that, that courts defer to and lean toward and uh, really favor government government witnesses, police, anybody who's employed by the government. Um, and it's not even, you know, the, the law was, was designed to defer to citizenry. That's why we have the Constitution. And, and any more in just about any court in the land, and, and, you know, this is a pretty bad example of it, um, they, they defer to whatever the, the local police and in, in people in uniform or people in and government employees say or do as having more weight than uh, what the, the citizen says or does. And that's, this is a, a horrible example of it, but it, it runs rampant throughout our legal system everywhere. Whereas a government witness somehow uh, will say something and because they work for the government that is somehow seen as objective and good and right Whereas somebody who is a, a near Nobel laureate in their field, a professor who's written, published literally hundreds of papers on the subject if they're brought by the defense because uh, they are paid, not paid, well, the government witnesses are paid as well, but because they're paid by a private party, um, the court will almost invariably decide with the government appointed expert. So this is a graphic example of, in essence, deference, you know, deference to the horrible actions of, you know, a complete violation of, of people's rights, constitutional rights. But, um, you know, if uh, I would hope that if I were uh, accused of something and, and I was in court, uh, and that I would be smart enough after this example just to stop, uh, I want a lawyer, period. 
and stop talking until you and get then one. Just, yeah. yeah, that was his and mistake, obviously. Yeah. Didn't stop and just talking. say, I want a lawyer. And every time they ask you a question, say, um, I want a lawyer. And that's, I, I think, lawyer. good good advice I, for anybody who is under uh, under interrogation by police under pretty yeah. much any or and under any any government organization yeah. that has police powers. And unfortunately, now they all do. Every independent regulatory agency has all three powers. They have legislative powers, they have judicial powers, and they have executive powers because they can make up rules and regulations that have the weights and penalties of laws. They judge your activities as if they are the judiciary, and then they pass sentence um, and, and can, you know, force of arms to send you to jail or take your property, so executive. And so I want a lawyer, I want a lawyer, I want a lawyer. That's, Co yeah, a couple that's of weeks ago. Uh, Where did you go, Jason? You wanted, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> well, yeah, and I interrupted him. No. <laughs> uh, awesome advice. Uh, one thing I just can't get over, too, in thinking about this case is, if the person had come in speaking an entirely different language, I would think the police would have gone out of their way to bring in an interpreter. And the idea that, you know, he just used a uh, little bit of slang and they take no effort at all to try and understand what that means and just say, well, he's looking for a lawyer dog, obviously, <laughs> Rin Tin Tin. <laughs> so, just seemed rather silly. That's a, that's a wonderful point, Jason. So, it, in essence, the man was speaking a different language. And instead of making sure that, that they understood what he was saying, they chose to interpret uh, what he asked for as... They chose you know. to misinterpret a synonym. Yeah. Uh, President Donald J. Trump has declared a war on opioids. Mm. It's the, uh, the scare drug of, uh, of, of the moment right now. Um, is there any possibility at all that this declared war on opioids will have any more success than Prohibition, Nixon's war on drugs, Reagan's, Nancy Reagan's uh, Just Say No, uh, or any of the rest of the myriad drug war well, about tactics any of the that have been war, used. War on poverty, war on illiteracy. Well, let's, 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 on let's, let's limit this to the drug wars right now. Okay, drug war Don't limitation. Don't give them any more ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we could talk all night. Yeah, not a bad idea. Well, I, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's yet in another extension of the, the war on drugs, and I, I just can't imagine anything that's been more disastrous in this country. And the funny thing was, I guess, when Donald Trump, uh, I guess, spoke about this and, and laid it out, he, he mentioned his uh, uh, cousin or brother, brother of his. Yeah, brother, brother Fred. Brother Fred, okay. And, and Fred had an alcohol problem. and. And he told him not to do alcohol, so he didn't, and and that was the best advice he'd ever gotten. And I, okay, so if if, if Trump is a teetotaler, mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> well, certainly there's that, but, but are just, you sure he doesn't have a shot of something before he tweets? Are you, <laughs> I think it's two it's, shots of vodka, one tweet. Two maybe shots a lot of, of caffeine in there. Something, <laughs> something, yeah. But uh, I, I just, you know, I can't imagine. I mean, here he's bringing up alcohol, as, as, and had the man not heard of Prohibition, <laughs> our big success in the war on alcohol that, that was one of the few things that we gained our sanity and ended. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important for Americans to understand that the war on drugs is never a war on drugs. It's always either a diversionary tactic or a way of changing the subject from something to another thing. Uh, basically hiding from real issues. Mm -hmm. The first war on drugs started, well, the war on drug, all drugs were legal back in the 19th century, everything. I mean, there were no drug laws whatsoever. The first drug laws How did passed, we survive? <laughs> the addiction rate was actually lower by, uh, you know, a, a, an order of magnitude than it is today, with all drugs legal. Patent medicines, medicine shows, pe people, you know, buying a miracle medicine, most of those were uh, either morphine or opium or, or laudanum. Or, 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 or laudanum. Mm -hmm. They were drugs that are now essentially illegal. Mm -hmm. And they were used by upper class women on a regular basis as well as the rest of the population. But not, ab not abused because there was no need to abuse them because there were no drug pushers, black market drug pushers, pushing uh, substandard or adulterated uh, products. It was all you know, commerce. Mm. The first opium laws were actually laws that were 
uh, passed against smoking <coughs> opium in, in California. Mm -hmm. Why were they passed? Because the Chinese laborers uh, imported to build the to uh, yeah to build the railroads and and uh, do the the grunt work on gold mines in California were Chinese. Their particular drug of choice was smoked opium. So smoking opium, opium dens, that was the first drug laws that were passed in the late 19th century. Nothing else happened until the until about 1912, 1908, 1910, somewhere around there, when Teddy Roosevelt got into the act and appointed a, uh, essentially the first drug czar. And of course, who can forget Harry Anslinger, the guy who said that uh, the weed marijuana was what caused um, uh, white women to take up with black men is essentially what he said. And I'm you know, sorry to say that, I'm just quoting or para paraphrasing what Harry Anslinger said, reflecting the fears of the day. Mm. Ehrlichman, in testimony, uh, said that the Nixon White House started the drug war because they had two enemies in the election and after they were in office. One were hippies and the other were blacks. So criminalize marijuana to go after the hippies and put them in jail, criminalize heroin to, uh, to go after the blacks and put their leaders in jail, and you've successfully diverted the, the, uh, the topic from whatever uh, atrocities Nixon was carrying on on the, on the evening news to the drug war. Mm. Uh, and it's been going on ever since. And only now, with marijuana, Fortunately, unfortunately, not not the harder drugs. Is it starting to turn around? As people are saying, "Hey, you know what you've been telling us for these many many years that marijuana is dangerous and uh, you know the uh, the introductory only drug. if you're a Twinkie." <laughs> people are figuring out that it's a bunch of BS. So I'll I'll, I'll take a slightly different approach, and and it's uh, it might sound like I need my tinfoil hat here, but. Um, there, there are some people who say that there are no unintended consequences. And what happened um, when you uh, legalized alcohol, then all the hoodlums who made uh, a, a great living off of illicit bootleg booze were suddenly without a high margin product to sell. So you had to legalize something else so that they would have an income stream. And what, unfortunately, the, the problem with the opioids is it appears to be the same thing. And I'm not saying it's intentional, but the effect is the same. You had doctors that were pretty loose in some cases on prescribing opioids, typically for back pain. And opioids are addictive. And so you get all these people hooked on opioids and then you say you can no longer have these opioids for your back pain and back pain's no longer a problem, your, your opioid addiction is. So what do they turn to? Heroin, Fentanyl. morphine. Fentanyl. They turn to street drugs, and who benefits from the street drugs? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a, a doctor, a surgeon out of uh, Arizona who is also does work for Cato, mm -hmm. who did some interesting statistical work with the uh, Center for D Disease Control. Mm -hmm. He tracked the statistics between opioid prescriptions and opioid overdoses mm -hmm. from I think 2006 to 2010. Those are the years statistics were actually mm -hmm. available. And there was, a, there was a, a positive correlation. It was a low correlation, one in 13,000 mm. uh, users of uh, prescribed opioids died. Mm. In 2010, the Fed started cracking down on supposed opioid overprescribing. Mm. That positive correlation turned into a negative correlation. The more that opioids were not prescribed, the more deaths there were from other opioids, mm. primarily mm. the the uh, the fentanyl and the and the heroin and the and the, and the black market uh, mm. oh, because of products. lack of quality control and consistency with yeah. product yeah. which you would get from something from a pharmacy yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you just hit the nail on the head which is the biggest problem with any kind of a, a drug war is 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 the black market that that gets generated by it and that's generally what uh, creates a lot of the crime that tends to trail along with it uh, tends to um, create f situations of fraud where you can't, uh, people can't defend their property rights in a black market because if somebody sells them a low quality or uh, poisonous product, you can't really go to the police and say, hey, you know, I was breaking the law, but while I was doing it, uh, this guy, you know. Uh, Poison me. Exactly, yeah. And, Tried and, to kill me. Yes. Yeah. There was a, there was a or drug. Or took my money. There was a yes. bootlegger back in the, back in the, in the, in the 20s who became a, a millionaire and he would now be a billionaire in today's dollars. 
And he gave a dinner party where he gave a, a car to everybody that came to his dinner party. Bootleggers or black market drug dealers today aren't giving cars to everybody that comes to a dinner party, but they are funding a whole lot of uh, uh, contributions to politicians to make sure that their, uh, their product remains illegal. Mm. Yeah. I would guess. I don't know that, but I would guess that. Well, you know, that's uh, soft money. Right. Under uh, the Republicans, the federal spending is, of course, going down because Republicans preach lower spending and lower taxes and so mm -hmm. forth. Wait, under Republicans, federal spending is actually going up? What's that all about? You're looking at me as, I have, as if I have an answer to this. Well, I think that, that they are no longer Republicans. They're certainly not Goldwater Republicans. I, quite frankly, don't know what kind of Republicans they are because they're... Um, they're outspending the Democrats, and and I think one of the promises made. We don't expect, you know, presidents to keep all of their promises, and many presidents keep none of them. Uh, they break promises they didn't even make. But uh, in this case, I think one of the things that Trump said was not only that he's going to drain the swamp, but that he's going to rein in government spending, and that hasn't happened. And uh, I, I. Uh, I think a big part of that is that it's the, the special interest groups who, who, who are making their money off the spending, you can't wean them off of it. It's like once the economy got used to people overspending through credit cards, then you know if you tighten up credit, then the economy comes to a screeching halt because that extra 5 or 6% of spending just disappears. Um, and I think if, if you look at the, uh, the the highest income zip codes in the country around Washington, D.C., or as we like to refer to it, the imperial city. And uh, it's when, when people are making a fortune from uh, spending money with, with very little accountability in many cases in government programs and cost plus contracts and all the rest of that, it's awfully hard to wean them off of that, especially when they're giving the politicians who, who grab this money and hand it out to them millions of dollars to get reelected because it's all about power. I quite frankly don't know how to fix it. Um, it we ha other than a viable third party, you know, because uh, nowhere in the Constitution does it say that uh, the U.S. is a two-party system. And until not that long ago, uh, we had many parties in this country, and whenever a new party come, came into place, um, and started getting some popularity, one of the other parties would absorb it and, and take on that platform as part of their, their uh, but now, you know, third parties are basically frozen out of the process in most places. So, I don't know how to fix it. Well, this is one of the big problems with the Republican Party too, is that, you know, they constantly preach a game of, of fiscal uh, conservancy and, and uh, you know, cutting down funding of government programs, but in the end, there's lots of programs that they like, and so they, uh, they constantly, you know, are, are for their representatives uh, bringing home the bacon to their districts and... and uh, well, yeah, I mean, it comes down to essentially the, uh, the primary job of a Republican or a Democratic congressman or senator is to get reelected. Mm -hmm. yeah. And once a government program has been enacted that has a constituency of people who are on, who are getting benefit from it, whether it's Social Security or Medicare or uh, Medicaid or defense spending, you name it, once it's in place, it's very, very difficult politically to get rid of it. If you take a look at the federal budget, two thirds of the federal budget is so-called uh, non-discretionary spending, and I mean by that I mean Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, welfare and the uh, and the interest on the federal debt. That's two thirds, a little bit more, of the federal budget. Defense spending is about 16 percent. We spend probably twice as much or three times as much on defense spending as we should, but it's a small part of the of the of the budget compared to the uh, the, the income transfer programs. But those income transfer programs are the third rail of politics. No Republican, none, are willing to touch them. The Republicans are starting, or, you know, are talking starting uh, starting last week uh, talk about a, a, a the, the big vaunted Trump tax cut and a tax cut is necessary a tax cut is a good idea particularly the corporate tax cut because corporations don't pay taxes anyway only uh, employees stockholders and uh, customers pay taxes the corporations just collect them for the government but you can't have the kind of tax cuts they're talking about without corresponding spending cuts because all you're doing is you're transferring the tax from taxpayers to 
people who are to, to, the, to the debt market because the government's going to have to borrow. So yeah. whether the government takes money out of the economy by borrowing it or by taxing it, it has the same, essentially the same net effect on economic viability. And it's not a good effect. The higher taxes are, the more money that's spent in a non-productive fashion, mm -hmm. the less viable the economy is. Well, I'm sure that grandchildren that you don't have, because you're not grandpapa, yeah. uh, wouldn't, and mind, remember that. wouldn't mind paying off all of this debt that we're accumulating? Well, no, I mean, we're, we're accumulating debt. It's, it's, it's difficult to conceptualize it when you think of the debt in terms of billions and trillions. Like Everett Dirksen says, a billion here and a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. Real money, money. yeah. But if you, take a thing, if you think about it in terms of, uh, of uh, expenditures and debt per person, then it takes on a real meaning. And right now, the government, the federal government, is borrowing in 2017, borrowing over $2,000 per person, every man, woman, and child in the United States, per person. That's what the deficit spending is. That's how much is being borrowed on my behalf, on your behalf, on your behalf, and ultimately will either have to be paid by our grandchildren or uh, the country will have to go bankrupt one way or another. Mm. Well, you know, and it, it, you look at Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, well, go ahead. When you look at a microcosm, to one area where I think within the Republican ranks, when Ron Paul was running for president, he specifically called out defense and the idea that we, are, I think that's 16 percent of the budget or yeah. somewhere about there. But the idea that what we're calling defense is having, you know, military bases all over the world. I mean, that sounds more like an empire than than an actual defense. I think when most people think traditionally of defense, you think of people keeping people from from raiding you know your your country with an army but not uh, policing the world and and I you know he made the case at least he, he tried to make the case to Republicans that you know if, if we simply pull back a lot of this world police force and let people take care of their own business we can actually start to rein in spending but that didn't carry the day in the Republican LNC chairman Nick Sarwark, Nicholas Sarwark tweeted something to the effect of if uh, if uh, we didn't have troops in Nigeria Trump wouldn't have to embarrass himself with making clumsy uh, calls to the widows of uh, victims of violence in Nigeria mm. <laughs> what in the, or Niger I'm sorry Niger what are we doing with troops in Niger why sure well, and why does the other than for a soundbite, why would the President of the United States make a call to a widow? Well, I mean, that's another that's, story, but... You know, that's, that's just a publicity. It's a publicity stunt gone wrong. Well, yeah. this is the terrible thing, too, for, you know, you look back at Jerry, Gary Johnson's campaign, and he stumbled on uh, the Syrian city, I, I can't Aleppo. remember. Aleppo. Aleppo. Yeah. There you go. And the idea that, you know, his whole game is talking about spending less, bringing our troops home, not policing the world. So his game isn't to know the capitals and cities of every single place around the world where we might want to bomb or have troops. And the idea... That'd you know, be all of them. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so it's perfectly understandable that that wouldn't be the first thing on his mind. It, it's a little more disturbing that that might be the first thing on Hillary or Trump's mind that they don't. Aleppo, I can tell you all about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think Speaking of, of telling uh, us all about uh, what's going on in, well, let's say Russia, uh, the uh, scandal for the last year almost now has been that uh, the Trump uh, presidency was uh, accomplished by collusion with the Russians. Mm. And I don't know whether there's collusion with the Russians or not. I don't think anybody really does. I mean, I mean on the Trump side. On know. the Trump side. Uh, we know that... Uh, uh, the special counsel uh, Mueller has now arrested Paul Manafort and a couple of his uh, associates, not for anything to do with the Trump campaign, but just you know stuff that they did in private business prior to that, prior to being on the campaign. But we do know, without any question at all, that Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, made it possible for uh, a Russian company, Rosatom, to buy 20% of uranium reserves in the United States by uh, facilitating a deal to buy uh, uranium one. We know that. Mm. We also know, without any question whatsoever, that the Russians made very large contributions to the Clinton Foundation. Mm. We know, without any question whatsoever, that the Russians paid, I think it was $5 million, to Bill Clinton to give a, uh, a short speech. Mm. 
we know that there's a quid pro quo, or we can, you know, pretty obvious that there's a quid pro quo. There's mm -hmm. funny business going on when it comes to the, uh, the, the Clintons and the Democrats and Russia, and there may be as far as Trump and Russia mm -hmm. is concerned. The one party that has never ever gotten its hands dirty messing with, colluding with Russia or any other country are the libertarians. Um, and and I, I would agree with that. I'm. Um when, let's go. Let's go back to the Hillary thing for a while, and the 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 complete lack of press coverage on this in in the. I mean, that started back in 2010. It's lame been, stream media. Yeah, I mean, it's, even it's, in 2010, it was it was it was nothing. It was a blip in the news day and immediate cover up and all the rest of and that. And Snopes is, is saying it's it's not true mm -hmm. when it's obviously true. I mean, you know, the, the political and Snopes, the people who are supposedly mm -hmm. uh, the fact checkers, they're wrong. Well, no. None of the fact-checking organizations are remotely uh, objective, and they're 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 not concerned with checking facts. They're they're concerned with uh, maintaining an agenda, uh, maintaining an agenda, and and bending facts to support the candidates of choice, which in in ninety percent of the time have been Democratic candidates, and and. Uh, uh, shooting down anything the libertarians might have to say, and and putting the Republicans, uh, you know, unfortunately, on their side. So, you know, that that uh, word objective and truth and all the rest of that, those those terms shouldn't be used when it comes to political parties. I don't think. Well, one piece of hopeful knowledge is that the libertarians are actually making a very concerted effort to put 2,000 people on the ballot in 2018, which mm -hmm. is twice as many as ever has happened in an off, uh, you know, in a non-presidential election ever. And in Pennsylvania, they're making kind of a, a, a couple of interesting uh, showings. The uh, candidate for coroner in, uh, in one city is actually the, uh, in the, the sitting coroner. Uh, he's a libertarian. And in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, a libertarian candidate successfully sued the city of Scranton for taxing illegally. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that some, sometime in the future, but uh, right now, thank you very much for being part of the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank on you, the air, Richard. On the air at uh, Channel 17 Sacramento, on the web, accesssacramento.org, Channel 17, and on YouTube. Within days of the show, due to the efficiency of the crack troops running the control room here on Libertarian Counterpoint. Professionals. Within are. days. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very much. Much.